Well, thank you all for having me tonight, and I am really honored to be here uh, to present my first discussion about my book to be released on May 13th. This book would not have happened without the help of all the good folks at the History Center. Um, Samantha uh, has come in and just done a tremendous job. Uh, Stuart Parks does not accept bribes. Um, just know that um, when you try to get images printed on the fly really fast. They have a great procedure though, so if you follow it, they do really good. Um, and uh, Tam McCreef. Fabulous. So the three of them um, have seen me sort of run in and out of here several times as I've been putting this book together. In putting together this book, I accumulated information on over 300 lost restaurants of the Outer Banks. And when I say lost restaurants, what I mean is a restaurant that opened and was beloved and is no longer open. And there have been a uh, many. And I know that all of you have seen them come and go, and especially in certain locations. It's like, what are they going to be this season, you know, <laughs> right? And so people have favorites, and they, you know, especially things like their favorite corn appetizer. Like, is it a lacy corn cake? Is it a griddle cake? Is it a, you know, so. All these restaurants made all of these um, fabulous dishes that you know and remember. Fortunately, my publisher has said that we get to do volume two because we had so much research. So the, that 300 restaurants, I had to figure out a way to narrow down which ones would make the book. And once you get to know me, you're going to learn that I don't really just pick the low-hanging fruit. I'm not just satisfied with the folks that are always in the press and in the media. I wanted to know, it turned out, how did you buy a plate of food on the Outer Banks? And when could you do it? And who could do it where? So I've lived here 33 years. I came here fresh out of college. I thought I knew it all. I worked in the restaurants. I knew some people, but I didn't ask questions. I was in the South. I'm from Michigan. Jackson, just in case y'all are Michigan reference people. And I went to high school in Florida. I went to college at Averett University, which is in Danville, Virginia, which um, has a history of Southern uh, isms, we shall say. And so when I moved to the Outer Banks, there was a spirit of, um, hmm, it was a little bit like the Wild West still. You know, I know it was even more Wild West before I got here, but there were artists and there were people who were living, you know, they didn't wear shoes and they were doing commerce and it seemed to work out and, you know, being 20, 21, 22, this was, this was pretty important and influential to me and helped me understand that you could do commerce and you could have wonderful things and some crazy people in the restaurants, we'll call them characters or we'll call them whatever, that I got to know personally that actually ended up in the book. So my world on the Outer Banks has gone sort of back and forth between restaurants and publishing and art. And they all seem to make sense on the Outer Banks. You pick sort of what you want to do and people sort of let you do it. And then I got my degree in journalism. So I've always been curious. And so when I decided I maybe wanted to write instead of work in the restaurants, I was fortunate enough to be able to have some columns. So I had columns in the Virginia Pilot, the Outer Banks Coast, the Little Weekly, and um, some magazines and did some different media. And I've also made a place for myself. Um, we're fortunate, like on the Outer Banks, there can be like one blacksmith guy, and I turned out to be like the food lady. So I've worked with the Travel Channel, and I've worked with the James Beard Foundation, and I've worked to with professional organizations, Southern Foodways Alliance, to help people know how important food is here in Northeastern North Carolina. Um, a few of you have seen um, one of my favorite TV chefs, maybe um, Vivian Howard on PBS, right? She's introduced Northeastern, more Eastern North Carolina to uh, a lot of food sources. We here in Northeastern North Carolina have a lot of coastal traditions that show up on the plate and they always have. Um, locally harvested, these are buzzwords that we've lived 
ever since the Outer Banks had the indigenous people. So how it came to be that we had a restaurant industry and a restaurant culture, those were questions I needed to ask. We know that Currituck County is the oldest county in the state. Dare County, did you know that? Yeah, yeah right. Dare County was a part of it. That's right. So we've got some things to, that we could go deep into, and that, was, that leads me to a really good point because research, how many rabbit holes were there that I went down because everything was so interesting. You know, it's like asking the questions why and when. And so when I um, started to write the book, it was only because I was contracted to write the book. Okay, a lot of people write a book and then they shop a book. I was very fortunate that in uh, this community, we have good neighbors and my good neighbor friend is Beth Story. And she has her own publishing company and she wrote a, an article about restaurants on the Outer Banks. Arcadia Publishing folks found her article and talked to her about having some food books. I don't know if they knew that she published her own books, so that was kind of cool, that she said she declined. She sent them to me. We connected. They said, we'd love you to write a book. You've got the credentials. What would you like to write about? Well, that stymied me. I d had no idea. So they said, we've got this series of books called Lost Restaurants, and it's been successful in other places. And I said, Lost Restaurants? We've got Lost Colony. Of course, it just fits. And, and it's not a lot of pressure because it's not like my theme, right? It's not me trying to say something. It's research. This is histories and facts and stories and anecdotes and photos. And I can do that. Well, what I didn't understand was the, the part that I would have to research for the contract, okay? A book contract is something that is no joke, okay? Because researching, um, there's not really like a fact-checking department anymore for publishers, and they let you know that in these big contracts that you sign, that it's your responsibility to fact-check. And so, to say that I'm more than a little bit nervous about this is um, an understatement. So I have um, done my best and I've really tried. Um, so we don't have um, fact checkers for this book. We have a great community. We have the Outer Banks History Center. We have uh, people who are willing to share stories with me. And when I started to write the book and research and pull things together, Honestly, I had no idea what I was getting into. No idea whatsoever. I thought that it would be an amplification of my columns. Just, you know, 12 col I did 20 columns a year. One year, one year I did 40 columns a year. Okay, so if I explore 40 restaurants, it should only take me about 40 weeks to write this book, right? Oh my goodness, you know. So then I had to figure out, well, of these 300, what the? And then I started asking the really big questions, which was like, hmm, all these restaurants seem to be owned by white people. Okay, so where are the restaurants that are owned by people of color? All right, that led me to some realizations um, that we don't have a lot of restaurants that are owned by people of color. And did we? And where did um, black people buy food when we had Jim Crow when we had segregation and um, I was very very fortunate to have the guidance of Virginia Tillett who invited me to her house let me sit at her table and ask questions that um, this white woman had never asked before I cried those white woman tears that they say if you're woke you shouldn't be doing well I had no idea how unwoke I was I thought I was pretty woke but I never asked the questions how could I how could I know you know, I started asking. I started walking the streets. I started talking to people. I mean, I was, I went deep into this. We have a very dark history. Um, it was hard for me to pick out what to write about. Fortunately, I had a really great editor who said, this is upbeat, right? And it's like, but people have to know this. People have to know this. She's like, but not in this book. We have to, you know, so it's like, wow, where do I, how do I fit in this context? How do people need to know these things? So we worked really hard to 
um, look at some places and what what did it mean to be able to buy a plate of food if you were black in Mantio okay so I'm gonna I'm gonna share this picture right here and Benny I'm not sure if you can get an image of this later but I'm gonna um, pick it up so that you can see it in the camera but this is Virginia Tillett's maternal grandmother this is Lila Simmons okay Lila Simmons was an entrepreneur she and her best friend Cordelia Wise opened boarding houses here on Roanoke Island and took in black boarders who were working with the Civil Air Patrol and who were working on the bridges and uh, doing local work they had no place to stay so these women opened boarding houses okay this is really how restaurants began on the Outer Banks. They began in boarding houses and they became, began in waterfowl hunt lodges. Okay? So there's a couple named Bernie and Skippy, Skipper, Skipper Griggs, who opened a uh, Hampton Lodge campground in Water Lily. Okay? Wealthy white industrialists would come down, men, they would have guides, they would hunt. Uh, people like um, Lila Simmons would pluck the geese and these men would eat their food out over the sounds and so there would be camp cooks who would cook for them, right? So restaurants basically started adjoining an accommodation, right? People came, they spent the night, they needed to eat something, okay? So these folks fed them. Skipper and Bernie Griggs, they were pretty savvy too. They said, okay, all these industrialists who, you know, they built the Wellhead Club and Kerala, and they've got families, and we've got this beautiful ocean over here, right? So they said, we're going to build an inn. It's called Croatan Inn. Do y'all remember Croatan Inn? It turned into Papagayos and Quagmires, and yeah. They started that, okay? They said, come back, bring your families. <laughs> excuse me, this was before there were bridges, so they would come over on boats and mules would pull along their uh, luggage and things, and the, the beach road, it was right around, in the mid-1930s, right around 37, that the beach road was built, and that was constructed not long after. So the beach road was accessible, and uh, the families would come and stay at the Croatan Inn. Because they were used to a certain level of of service. These folks had money, right? The first restaurants on the Outer Banks, you're going to say they had jack waiters with jackets, bow ties, you know, I mean, full on service. And it was expected and it was provided. So um, when we look at some older pictures, you know, we've got some extremes, we've got some really high end restaurants that came first because the families were coming with the wealthy white industrialists and they all dressed for the meals, they all, but they stayed there and they ate there. And then after a while the other restaurants would come, the family styles and things like that. Um, doing the research about all of these things introduced me to a lot of people in our community who have shared with me. Melody Lackey, um, sh I thought maybe she might be here tonight, but she has like a secret treasure trove of really cool stuff of um, history, postcards, um, and she shared a lot of things with me that ended up in the book. There's over a hundred photos in the book. Some are images, some are ads, some are old photos, some are new photos. Um, I try to give some context in the book, um, whether it's historical or cultural. And one of the things that affects all of us and did from the beginning are the bridges, right? So bridges created neighborhoods and they um, also were responsible for getting people across the bridge so they could buy Frank Sticks lots, right? And that was told to me over and over again, whether it was um, Kiki Kiosis, who was, the, they, she and her husband Perry were the second owners of Point Harbor Restaurant in Currituck. They talked to me about how they came down and got a piece of property and who financed it and how it, you know, so um, these are very important things and I'm, I'm thrilled that y'all are having this uh, flat top party. Um, y'all are, this is great. Um, so what I would like to do now is just 
share with you a little bit, I thought maybe I'd read a little bit from the book um, that describes um, a little bit about why the bridges were so necessary and important and, um, and then maybe open it up for some questions. Um, would that be okay? Mm -hmm. Is that all right? Okay. All right. Um, bridges were needed for any type of meaningful growth, and especially if the Outer Banks wanted to promote tourism, which many residents did. Several northern beach developers initiated the Wright Memorial Bridge project and even incurred some of the expenses. Could you imagine that today? The goal was the goal for some was hospitality. The goal for most was to bring visitors to the Outer Banks to buy property. These links to the mainland increased visitor traffic in all three counties, and they also increased the need for services of all kinds. Overnight guests needed places to sleep, and they definitely needed places to eat. It made sense that many of the first restaurants were adjoining boarding houses and luxury hotels. They had captive audiences. Small fountain shops, burger bars, fried fish joints, and family eateries soon followed. The larger hotels continued to feature fine dining and views of the waves. Their guests were, after all, economically abled. Many hailed from larger cities and were used to certain standards of service. Waiters in jackets served multi-course meals and guests dressed for dinner. Family-style restaurants emerged in the 1960s and welcomed guests of all ages and parties of all sizes. Big baskets of lacy corn cakes or cornbread or corn griddle cakes appeared on the tables after everyone ordered. Sparks still ignite when diners reminisce about which fried corn appetizer was the best, meaning their favorite. Business flowed and land development was gradually paced until the 1980s when everything changed and the vacation real estate boom was full on. This was the decade when sales folks introduced the tourists to timeshare units. Beach rental properties became investments, land was affordable, and developers bought large swaths to build what many still call McMansions, oversized rental homes densely packed into contrived neighborhoods active only three months a year from Memorial Day until Labor Day. According to advertisements, this development boom was for everyone. When, while visiting the Outer Banks, you could tune in to the local TV channels and learn, between commercials for local restaurants, just how to purchase a second home, one that not only paid for itself, but also gave off income. If it seemed too good to be true, that is because it was, though it took a few years for investors to realize. Property values continued to rise, people continued to buy and sell and redecorate and build bigger piers and add pools and gourmet kitchens. This was the golden age for property development and it was the same for local restaurants. Real estate agents were selling high, and they and industry associates spent their money in the local economy, especially in the local restaurants. Tipping was big, and re-tipping was even bigger, as many of the highly tipped would spend their evenings in late-night bars recirculating the money they had just pocketed. Wine Spectator Awards were garnished, sellers were enhanced, and pricey bottles topped local wine lists. Y'all remember this, right? Remember? Oh, oh gosh. The 90s brought more of the same, and investors were sure it would never end. By the time the real estate market crashed in 2007, many outer bankers were house poor and the money stopped circulating. Wine dinners dried up, holiday parties ceased, and big tippers were usually from out of town, if at all. The recovery has been slow, and the outer bank's eater has changed. Locals spend their money recovering from storms and have less money for eating out. When they do, they are looking for quantity as well as quality. Over the last decade, the majority of new restaurants on the Outer Banks have been casual. Few, few have cloth napkins, let alone tablecloths. What is old is new again, and recycling, reusing, and repurposing seems to be the local mantra. Corn cakes have even reappeared. It is a little harder, though, to find fresh local seafood on menus these days. Fishing regulations have changed, and big food distributors now deliver imported product to the back door of most commercial kitchens. It is cheaper, they say. Not all restaurants have made the change, and it is often hard to tell who is serving what. Be sure to ask if the seafood you are ordering is fresh and local. And just one last little bit. Um, the majority of restaurants here today on the Outer Banks in rural North Carolina only exist be because of tourism. The local population could not support them all. 
Most restaurateurs admit that locals are not even their target diners, and they market and price their menus accordingly. A handful of eateries do still cater to locals and thrive on the added boost of revenue in the summer months. It wasn't always this way. The Outer Banks didn't always have restaurants. Exploring the concept of paying for a plate of food in this area reveals that the word restaurant is a fairly modern one. And before the 1960s, most local eateries were called shops, cafes, lodges, or diners. For decades, from the turn of the century until the 1960s, there were villages on the Outer Banks where you could purchase a meal only at a boarding house or a waterfowl hunting lodge. Savvy entrepreneurs like Lila Simmons and Cordelia Wise opened boarding houses on Roanoke Island and provided seasonal meals for traveling black workers and visitors. Waterfowl hunters ate what was served up by the local camp cooks in Currituck, often tucked into thermoses and wrapped in paper, eaten midday in the field or in duck blinds on top of the sounds. Many locals, especially on Hatteras Island, rarely paid to have anyone cook for them, even when given the opportunity. Few still do save the occasional community dinner or fundraising fish fry. Restaurants south of the Oregon Inlet found it incredibly challenging to survive on local trade alone, and most eateries along the southern beaches relied almost exclusively on hungry tourists. And that was definitely one of the more interesting aspects of researching the different communities and the different traditions. But Hatteras folks have been self-reliant, as we know, and as far as going out to eat, I talked to a lot of folks. It's like, what was your favorite place? Where did you get? We just didn't. So um, I know that some did. And I know, so in my next book, I really want to hear and see some of those Hatteras stories and pictures. So um, spread the word, if you would, please. Um, when I first moved to the Outer Banks in the mid 80s, there were only a handful of eateries up and down the entire beach. Uh, high end to grab and go. It was easy then to name from memory every restaurant on the newer main road called the Bypass as well as the ones that line the beach road. These days there are almost 400 restaurants independent and franchised operating in Dare, Currituck and Hyde counties. Workers have become owners and their children now tend bars. The population continues to increase and new restaurants open weekly. Legacy restaurants like Owens in Nags Head and Blue Point and Duck continue to serve new and returning guests. Things have changed, yet they are very much the same. I have found that the way, the only way I could narrow down the restaurants that I could include in this book was by process of, um, I had to, I guess, okay, so, did they have a picture? Did they have a recipe? And was I comfortable with the facts and the vignettes that I was provided and am providing? Okay, so of the 300 restaurants that I covered, some might have only had a photo or a vintage ad or somebody shared a story. But if I couldn't find enough information to share, and some I have a lot of information and some I have a little bit of information. so. As I go back and look at this book, I don't, I, I told Samantha, I think I went into kind of a trance when I wrote that. Maybe you edit that out, but I don't know. But, um, but it was really, it was deep and it was very intense in writing the book and learning about the process and working with the editors and figuring out what I could put in and not put in. And then we were talking about restaurants and this had to be PG, okay? This was the Outer Banks. This was the Wild West. There were stories, and people did not hesitate. You know, you're smiling. <laughs> yeah, lots of stories. So, um, how about anybody asking questions or want to talk? Ms. Dawn? Uh, well, from my childhood, my earliest memories were Spencer's, and yeah. the original one over in Man's Harbor, which, of course, they were on the route to the ferry that we took prior to the bridge being built. Uh, so that was key. And Polly's Kitchen, uh, also over there. I don't know if they're on your list. We've got, we've got pictures of the Duchess, but, uh, uh, but really Walker's Diner that supplied all the food to, to the prisoners, et cetera, that was big. And across the street was a Barron's restaurant. Fried shrimp was probably my favorite thing. It was a Sunday treat to go out to one of these restaurants. Okay. Yes. 
Yes, Don, and you, um, so some of these pictures are in the book, some aren't, um, some make, we, uh, maybe we'll make the next book. Um, Drew Wilson, fabulous, he is one of my um, favorite documenters because he gets up close to people. He captures profiles, um, you know, and Bridges made the book, um, not this photo, but um, Spencer's is in the book. I've heard great things about Polly's, Duchess of Dare is in the book. Some of these had so many things, and then some of them were hard to tell the stories of, too, because places like, um, I had to, I heard stories that involved uh, Jim Crow era uh, black workers in the kitchen. Black uh, residents could not eat in the dining room. They had to order from the back door. And I was told these stories about uh, certain restaurants, and I made the choice not to uh, name the restaurants that I was told about because I don't feel it's fair to color uh, these one particular restaurant because I was told a story about that because it was it was very common during the time that. Um, and there's a book called uh, Chronicles of a Colored Kid by Dr. Henry Johnson who lived here and in Hyde County and he worked at the Carolinian and he lived at the Carolinian and he worked as a waiter and he talked about not seeing blacks on the beach and there were no black lifeguards and how everybody when they uh, were ready to, um, you know, when they got off work they all came over here to Manio where there were these fabulous juke joints and you know, at the casino, they couldn't, uh, blacks couldn't come in the casino except on special black nights, and uh, Fats Domino said he wouldn't perform there unless blacks could come in. And so, you know, we've got a lot of history of segregation here, and we've got a lot of history of, of Jim Crow and how it affected restaurants and who could eat with whom, who cooked the food, and then, um, but at the same time, I heard joyous stories from people who lived these lives and from black people who lived these lives and people were familial in these communities and they um, were very accepting, surprisingly to me, of the times. And that's been very challenging for me to try to absorb and to try to translate and to try to share um, what a deep history the Outer Banks has culturally and you know the Freedmen's Colony was so significant to us and the history and going you know I found myself sitting and and just I feel like I have had folks ancestors channel me from a lot of restaurants and a lot of places and um, and again, I'm going to go back to thanking uh, Virginia Tillett for all of her help in guiding me through this. I'd like to read this part too because I think this this leads in. This is some of what I'm, I've been trying to maybe express about this is that uh, this was about, um, and I'm not sure how many of y'all have read um, uh, Patricia Click's book on the Freedmen's Colony, but. It um, <coughs> excuse me is really uh, worth reading. Uh, Roanoke Island uh, during the Civil War, Union occupied uh, Roanoke Island, which lies between. The, this is from Patricia Click's book. This is her word. These are her words. This quote: During the Civil War, Union occupied Roanoke Island, which lies between the North Carolina mainland and the barrier islands known as the Outer Banks, became home to thousands of former slaves. Initially, these refugees settled near the Union headquarters, creating a community that included churches and a school. In the spring of 1863, this camp evolved into a government-sanctioned colony. Major General John G. Foster, commander of the 18th Army Corps, ordered Horace James, a congressional, or congregational minister from New England who was serving as a chaplain in the Union Army, to establish a colony of former slaves on the island. Although the Roanoke Island Freedmen's Colony was an experiment of national significance, few people are aware of its history. At one point, it is estimated the population of the colony grew to over 3,000 people. Uh, Kathleen Angioni wrote about Click in her book, In Coast Watch. When the Confederacy collapsed in April 1865, the Union returned all 
excuse me, all land to owners who held title. The freedmen now faced eviction. But just as they labored to build their colony, the freedmen labored to keep it, or at least some of it. A small group petitioned the government requesting to rent the land where the home stood. In 1868, 11 petitioners scraped together $500 and bought 200 acres of land from the heirs of Thomas Doe, according to Click. By 1900, only 300 black residents lived on the island in a neighborhood called California. That year, the government divided the property into 11 lots based on the original buyers and their heirs. The black community grew independent of and isolated from the white population, except for a few occasions court, a few eateries with mixed clientele, and late night escapades on Good Luck Street and the juke joints on the north side of town. By the mid-century, Jim Crow had effectively divided local communities and when laws eventually changed, it did not mean that local behavior changed quickly. While most locals interviewed about this era said that there were few actual signs designating where blacks could or could not eat, Many remembered that there were places that were less safe for blacks to venture, and neighbors shared with one another where blacks were and were not welcome. So um, the reason that I, my book is divided into sections, and because of the stories that were shared um, on Manio, in Manio and on Roanoke Island, that's where we sort of explore the black history the most. Um, and but I do appreciate that you know the significance of duck and different developments um, and when you talk about deeds too and original deeds those get very challenging and we um, again are really conscious of the importance of uh, national legislation and civil rights and um, because on a lot of deeds there were restrictions that said that sales could not occur to African Americans to whites only and um, again as there's a lot of challenging history on the Outer Banks and I think that the more we talk about it and embrace it then um, we can acknowledge that the reason we have the wonderful food we have is because we have such a diverse community who did work together in the kitchens and um, you know they taught each other how to uh, tend to the collards and um, smoke the hams and Joe Tillett had the largest um, farm in uh, on Roanoke Island at one time and it was almost 10 acres. He had a smokehouse, they had ice, they had you know everything, they had uh, grist mills, they could do everything. So when you were self-sufficient you didn't need to really have restaurants or places to eat and so we had a lot of very self-sufficient people. We had fishers who traded with farmers and we learned how to feed ourselves which we still do after big storms we all come together and we make sure everybody's taken care of. Um, I've really enjoyed uh, sharing this with you. I think we, I'm going to like refine my comments as I go along. Um, I'll probably seek uh, deep therapy to help me with this because um, y'all shouldn't have to be subjected to my uh, working through this. But at the same time, if you read it, and you feel compelled to re research more, please do. If you feel compelled to talk to your black neighbors, please do. And it might be a little out of context and a little wacky, but y'all can work through it. Ask questions, ask difficult questions, and be prepared to hold, hold still, hold space, whatever the modern term is, and listen. And listen to what you might not know. And um, I, again, I look forward to anybody reading the book because I'm not really sure folks will, but if you do, thank you. And um, one, one more question. Do you have recipes in the book? Yes, there's recipes. Okay. <laughs> Do y'all want to talk about recipes for a minute? Do y'all want to, uh, collards, fried spots, um, fried spots? Do y'all know what that even is? Oh, yeah. Corn yeah. spots. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So corn spots does not mean anything that an ear of corn touched the spot, right? right. Right, it's the salt which we love. So we would, you know, catch the spot and salt the spot in big barrels. And then um, uh, Virginia Tillett told me how she remembers uh, Miss Lila saying, uh, "Go out to the uh, and get me ten spots for dinner because they're not going to eat them that night. They have to be soaked, and so they'll be for dinner the next night or maybe for breakfast." But um, 
the traditional foods and whether we call it soul food or coastal country or coastal Carolina, it's all these fabulous same ingredients and it's all our fabulous neighbors who have been cooking it up together. And one of the challenges about this was this book didn't start out to have recipes, but I found so many that they let me add it. So we didn't test all the recipes. We have just printed them as we found them. For the art show, we tested some of the recipes and it was like, oh my gosh, what, what, what? So this is part of the oral tradition of passing down recipes that you'll experience in this book. So thank you all for having me. Thank you. Appreciate thank you.